Welcome to our ZFZ monthly webinar. We run this live webinar monthly across our various sectors and practice areas. This month is our shipping, logistics and transport session. Thank you for joining us. We're, we're really pleased to have you here. We know how precious your time is and we're, we're very grateful that you've uh, decided to join us. We have a great turnout today, very excited, and we've got an excellent, important topic to go through an even better uh, stellar panel with us. So thanks again. I will be your moderator. My name is Luke Zadkovich. I am a partner and co-founder of Zyla Floyd Zadkovich, a lawyer and advocate qualified in England, New York, and New South Wales, Australia. Today's topic is presenting expert evidence in US and English maritime arbitration. As I said, I'm very excited by the highly experienced, highly regarded panel we've got today. They really are leaders in their field and, and a great bunch of people. We're going to look at this topic from three perspectives and across both US and English jurisdictions. From the lawyer's perspective, from the expert's perspective, and then from the arbitrator's perspective. I'll introduce each of our panelists in the order in which they'll be presenting. And there's absolutely no way that I can do their bios justice in uh, the short time we've got here and leave at least some time for them to uh, present themselves. So I do encourage you to look them up online. You can find their details in the usual places um, and, and do make contact, of course, if the need arises. So flying the lawyer's flag, uh, with me is my colleague, Eva Maria Meyer. Eva is an associate with Zyla Floyd Zadkovich in our New York office. Eva was actually the first associate hire that we made when it was just Ed Floyd and me a few years ago. In those four years since we launched, we have grown into an international law firm of 30 odd lawyers. In the shipping field, one of our firm's unique capabilities is the ability to advise seamlessly across both English and US jurisdictions and in transport more generally out of our Vienna office too. Eva studied at Tulane, a leading maritime university, obtaining a JD. Eva is fluent in English, German and Dutch. Eva is the secretary of the Oceans Committee at the Maritime Law Association in the US and is an active member of WISTA USA. Next, we will hear from the two experts. So we have John Walker with us. John is the Managing Director of Maritime for the ABL Group. That's known to many of us, many of us as the combined Braemar and LOC outfit. ABL is a global technical consultant for the shipping, energy, and renewables industry. John graduated as an engineer in the UK, sailed worldwide to the rank of chief engineer, and then came ashore to project manage new build cruise ships and major refits. Since 2009, he has been a consulting engineer performing major casualty investigations and providing expert opinion on shipbuilding and repair disputes worldwide. John has appeared before numerous courts and arbitral panels in the US and England. Among other positions, John is the current chairman of the Association of Average Adjusters, US and Canada. Third, next up, we will have Ian Hodges, Ian is a director at TMC Marine based in London, where he has been for the last 13 years. Prior to that, he spent three years as a superintendent at BP Oil International, based out of their Canary Wharf uh, office in London. Before that, Ian spent 19 years at sea on tankers, ferries, and cruise ships. He's been involved in hundreds of cases over the years, representing owners and charterers, usually with PI clubs involved as well. He writes about 12 to 20 expert reports every year to support solicitors for the purposes of litigation and ultimately a, a hearing, such as an arbitration hearing. 
then we will hear from our arbitrators who will of course have the last word on the topic. That's what happens in arbitrations. Mr. Charles Anderson will be the first of our arbitrators today. Charles will be known to many of our audience and has been a leader in our field for decades. He really needs no introduction. Charles is a member of the Society of Maritime Arbitrators in New York and a highly experienced US-based maritime and commodities arbitrator. Charles has been the head of School North America from 1998 until the end of February of this year when he handed over the reins to Osa Naman Jensen. Indeed, I understand that Charles will be formally retiring from school on July 1st, in a couple of days time. Prior to this, his, prior to his school role, Charles was a partner at a top New York maritime law firm for many years, where he practiced in all areas of maritime law. We're very honored to have Charles with us here today in his capacity as a US-based arbitrator. And I should emphasize that Charles will very much continue to accept arbitrator appointments into the future and the retirement only relates to the school role. Finally, we will have James Clanchy as our English-based arbitrator. Although James is involved in international arbitrations that touch on all over the world. James also has an impressive biography. James is, an, James is an aspiring full member of the London Maritime Arbitrators Association and is the honorary secretary elect of the LMAA. James held the role of registrar and deputy director general at the LCIA for four years and oversaw the administration of more than 1000 arbitrations under LCIA and UNSA trial rules. James was a practicing solicitor in shipping, commodities, and energy for three decades, working at some of the most well-known shipping firms in the London market. James is now a full-time arbitrator. I could go on and on, um, but let's get into the substance. Eva, um, I'll hand over to you. It might be helpful if you could uh, provide a, a platform for the rest of this discussion what is the formal role of an expert? What duties do they have? The process by which an expert is involved in arbitration, how it all works, and some of the important aspects to present a client's case as persuasively and as clearly as possible. Sure, thanks, Luke. Um, hi, everyone. My name's Eva Maria. Um, Luke has already introduced me, so I'll hop right into it. Um, I'll provide a, a short background as to why even have experts, what is an expert, how do you use an expert, and why is it important to have an expert. Um, so why experts? Generally, experts are used to assist an arbitrator to better understand factual underpinnings where technical or specialist knowledge is required. Um, so where there is a technical fact disagreement or where factual witness testimony will not suffice is when you would seek out an expert in whichever field is important to the case. And the role of such an expert, like I just said, is, is really to, to assist the arbitration panel to understand often very technical and hard um, factual circumstances that are extremely important to the case to understand really what was going on. Um, and it's very important for that expert to do so objectively. Um, it is not the uh, expert's require, um, role to argue legal aspects of that case. If anything, it might even discredit an expert if they step into that role. It's really just an objective expert view on factual circumstances. And also often to provide background information um, for context to a statement based by factual witnesses. They may have observed something, they may have been part of something, um, and an expert is there to explain why they saw what they saw, the result of what they saw, any of those things, and any scientific principles that are relevant to um, the claim. And why does expert evidence matter? 
like I said, it, it's supposed to help the arbitrator understand the nuances or the technical factual information that might be extremely complex. Um, they are there to provide an objective and credible um, assistance to legal arguments that an, a lawyer and attorney might be making. Um, and even although most often an expert might be engaged by a party, their obligation is still to ultimately to the arbitral panel. Um, and the great thing about experts, which differentiates them from a factual witness, is that they can use past experiences and build upon that. So they can review case documents, they can do independent research, they can conduct testing, all things that factual witnesses cannot do. So it provides a little, a little bit more suff, substance, a little bit more body to a legal argument. Um, and in order to properly do that, it's very important to choose the right expert for your purpose. Um, and so it's very important to make sure that the expert you are choosing for your case actually is qualified um, to testify, to write, to opine on um, whatever factual background information, technical information is relevant to your case. Um, it's not just important in the sense of making sure you're receiving accurate information, but it's also important um, to ensure that an opposing counsel is not going to try and seek to disqualify an expert's evidence um, on a particular topic based on being unqualified or using incorrect methodology that is not generally standard um, in whatever they are looking at, um, which it can be hugely detrimental um, if one loses their expert in, in an arbitration. And so it's also extremely important because they are kind of the resource that an arbitral panel relies on to ensure that everything, their opinion ultimately is correct is the, in the best way possible, is that those experts have good communication skills and an appropriate demeanor because ultimately they should be seen as an expert in whatever field they're testifying to. Um, and that that expertise and that ability to communicate should be strong both in writing as well as orally. And um, that leads me to the next point is how does one involve an expert once they've been chosen? And often it's actually really beneficial to uh, create uh, contact with an expert early on in order to ensure that um, case development and document gathering is um, all inclusive and actually Ta is tailored to what an expert might need in order to um, form an opinion on whatever you're they're being hired for, um, which includes discovery. And um, they can be extremely useful when even drafting, prior to drafting or when drafting briefs, because they can provide better understanding for technical and factual background. So not only can they be, be extremely useful for the arbitral panel, they can also be very useful for the attorney to better understand um, to properly formulate um, the legal arguments around that. Um, and then of course, for their use of experts reports, which, which will also help greatly um, uh, bolster the, um, the legal arguments that are being put forth and testimony. Um, and often, and, and I'm going back on this because this is just so important. Um, it's often an arbitral panel will ask their own questions to the expert. And so it's extremely important that that expert is objective and um, professional at all times because having an expert report saying one thing and then when questions are asked, um, something else coming to light can be extremely detrimental. Um, and so when it, experts in maritime cases, because of the nature of maritime cases being usually extremely technical and fact, technical factual disputes, um, we often see that experts will be involved in arbitrations. Um, and experts we have used in certain cases such as vessel performance or maintenance, um, speed and consumption, these are all highly technical issues. Or for example, the state of the market, um, one would, would, for example, use a broker who um, operates in that market or on weather. Um, it can be, you know, the master will probably testify as to the weather at the time, but it can be very useful to have an objective meteorologist also um, opine on, on the weather and its effects. Um, and one final note on this is, is not only is it important 
to reflect on when it's most beneficial to start involving an expert. Costs are, also, of course, also very important. So it's up to the lawyer to consider what exactly is the most important aspect that an expert would be useful for to ensure that their opinion and their time is really spent on that particular issue and it doesn't just become a general involvement in the case. Um, and also very important is setting a schedule, having open communications with that expert. They often are heavily involved, have really sought after people that might be on a ship. Um, and it, it's important to make sure that if you've chosen this expert, they will actually be available when, um, when necessary. And so early and good commu communications between the lawyers are key. And of course, keeping costs in mind as always. Um, and this is my little overview um, for when and why and how one would engage an expert and I'll pass it on. Thank you, Eva. I know you could speak for a lot longer on the topic, but a, a really good introduction there, much appreciated. Um, I think it's fair to say that expert evidence, particularly in shipping cases, uh, can be critical to the success or otherwise of a case. Many, many shipping issues are technical um, in their nature, even though it might flow into legal issues or commercial issues, a lot of them are technical. And experts provide opinions on disputed questions of fact. So I, I think I just had two very quick tips from me and then we'll get into um, having the, the experts um, present. One tip, and even mentioned this um, in passing, is to get experts involved early in the process. So many times we have seen um, instances where the operations team and the internal team at a client have dealt with an issue operationally. Maybe, maybe it's even been raised to claims, but it's being dealt with at an operational level. When claims get hold of it or internal lawyers, it then goes to the lawyers and the lawyers look at it and they look at the facts as presented. Um, they then apply the law and say, well, a legal analysis would lead to this type of result. Um, and then maybe the lawyers say, let's, let's fire off a, a demand for arbitration or commence arbitration. And uh, that's all done with a view to trying to resolve the claim, to bring the parties together, to put some pressure on the negotiations. And then before you know it, you found that you're, you're into submissions and you haven't even spoken with an expert yet. That is a mistake. Um, and I would highly recommend um, getting experts involved early in the process. Importantly, because I think they, they can play a very important role um, in uh, loss prevention and mitigating the actual issue. Then there's the, the evidential gathering and, and helping to pull together um, the facts and the data that sits within chips at an early point in time for their later reports. But then also from a litigation perspective, you want the experts to have given their opinion on the matter from a technical perspective so that you can then frame your claim or defend the claim in an, in an appropriate way. So that's tip number one for me. The other uh, tip that I, that I had uh, was it is a real art and a real skill for lawyers to be able to explain complicated legal issues in plain language. It's not easy to do and it is a skill. It is exactly the same for experts. Experts know their craft so well, they've spent years and years at sea often. Um, they, they know the detail, they know the technical side of uh, what they're talking about, but presenting it in a succinct way, in a persuasive way, in an objective, easy to understand way is very, very critical. Um, and it, it's so easy to get lost in detail um, in a report. So that ability to get to the nub of an issue, I think is really key in presenting expert evidence. So um, I, I hand it over to the experts now. I think it would be great if you could share some of your, your experiences in arbitration, what's your background, the technical uh, evidence that you, you tend to give, um, and maybe you share some of the tips uh, that uh, you have found from your experience work well in presenting evidence. Perhaps a few uh, touch on any um, instances where you thought, okay, that didn't quite go to plan, uh, a learning experience. Uh, and if, if you have any uh, observations on the differences between US and UK arbitration. Over to you, John. Okay, Luke and uh, Eva Marie, I think you've covered everything. So we're good, we're good for a coffee. Uh, <laughs> I, th I think the, the points already raised, I, I had a few of those down already. Um, 
But, but for me in the US, um, generally, whether it's going to be arbitration or a, um, a federal proceeding, uh, I'm not usually aware of, of whatever the, uh, the background of the contract are that are in uh, an issue or how it's being filed. So, so getting that across to the expert early is certainly useful because that may guide how your expert's going to write their report as well. There's certainly federal rules of procedure, which the expert gets held up to here in the state uh, as they would in, in London under the um, civil procedure rules there. So I think just knowing that and, and guiding your expert accordingly early on was one of the points I had um, without getting into all the nuts and bolts of it. But, but certainly that can trip um, some people up and you'll see reports come in sometimes from the other side. Sometimes I'll see drafts of reports from my guys and I'll say, well, okay, you need to uh, make that more robust or you, you need to move that around a bit. You need more information on this. So, so that certainly is something to bear in mind and for the, um, for the lawyers appointing experts, certainly let your, let your expert know what kind of jurisdiction, if it's gonna be arbitration, if, if it's being prepared solely for that purpose, if it may down the line turn into something else. Um, but the expert should be getting on board with that. The, um, hopefully that makes, that makes some sense. And I think that comes into that early communication with experts as well on, on what the, uh, what the background of the case is, sometimes legally, what, what our principles, what they're appointing us for is useful to know. We don't need to know all the legal ins and outs of it, but certainly we don't wanna be going off down, doing a huge amount of research and um, spending a lot of time and expense on areas that really aren't necessarily important to, to that case. So that, that communication backwards and forwards with the, uh, with the legal team is, is really important because we could spend a lot of time producing a very detailed report you guys get that report on your desk and then well hang on a minute half of this doesn't really apply to what we needed so that that backwards and forwards communication i think is, is really vital um so that was certainly something there uh, i think even marie mentioned it about knowing your expert quite often i'll get requests um, to act as an expert in a case which is beyond my scope of expert knowledge. So it might be something like a crane failure on board a ship. I've sailed on enough ships with cranes to be able to look at that and with an engineering background could certainly interpret that. But if it's a wire failure, something like that, then it makes more sense to, um, to get somebody with specifics on, on why that wire may have failed. Um, I would be happy to support that, for instance, as a maybe it's a seaworthiness issue of the ship and there needs to be a slightly broader look around the vessel at, at was the maintenance done properly generally? Was the crane maintained properly, for instance? But when it gets into why that specific wire failed, and um, yeah, just using that as an example, really, that's where your expert should be saying, okay, well, this is getting outside of my real area that I feel credible as an expert to testify at, uh, or as a generalist, I'll be happy to talk about it, but you really need an expert on that. And I've seen a few, I think, as you asked for a few examples, things like a um, a fire and explosion case, then pretty much the automatic go-to is to hire a fire and explosion expert. They may well be focused on how that fire spread, but oftentimes when there's a dispute then on a general average or between the, uh, the cargo side and the, the owners on whether that vessel was seaworthy, you're also going to need somebody who may be a marine engineer or a, a ship expert to determine was that ship being run well, were the crew trained properly, um, was, was that firefighting SOLAS provision in place and everything operating properly? Now, the fire and ex explosion expert should be looking at that also, but if it's a failure on machinery, how is that machinery maintained? Um, was the fuel pipe loose or bracketed properly and in, in, in line with customary practices? So we may, may expand the expert pool slightly there, but I think knowing what you're expecting your expert to talk about is is essential to, to getting the right result um, and not overextending that one expert. It may, may sound like a good idea to save some costs initially, but that would be um, some of my thought on that one. And also that, that getting somebody involved early to make sure that any evidence is preserved um, properly. Quite often when there's a machinery failure I'm involved with, the parts will all, already be removed, the repairs will be underway, but then the dispute happens a bit later on or it really gets going later on but by that stage the parts have been sent back to a manufacturer's workshop thrown in the scrap bin 
then it's very hard to then trace that back and, and get a true cause of the loss or or get that research done to find out what happened and when. And the same comes to even if we're not involved directly in questioning crew on what happened in a collision or a or fire situation, it's often over here the US Coast Guard or NTSB will take the crew aside, there may be criminal proceedings. I understand why they don't want the expert in the room asking questions directly. But if we at least have some input with the PI club's attorneys, we can ask them to potentially find out some of the information, ask those questions early on while it's fresh in the, uh, the crew's mind. And that can certainly save a lot of problems later on with um, conflicting testimony, uh, that side of things. So, so getting those questions in for and witness of facts before they're deposed, that would really be a suggestion. I would say, talk to your expert about the type of questions he would want to ask the master of the ship or the chief engineer on board. That way we're not just relying on the, um, the legal aspect, it would be more pointed questions. Okay, I think the only other thing I've really had here was make sure you go over the weak points of the case with the expert as well. If you know that your, your end client um, maybe had a ship that was over overdue maintenance or did have some issues or was potentially at fault, there are going to be weak points in most cases. That's why incidents have happened. So make sure we go and over those, discuss it with your expert um, so they can then address that when they do get those questions. I think it's very um, remiss for an expert to completely avoid the bad news. Um, you have to have that balanced approach and it really does help for our, our principals, the attorney, to help guide us through, through that part of it. So, yeah, I think that really, for me, was was most of it for my little bit here. I mean, I'll, I'll be available, obviously, and I'll have a bit of a panel discussion later on, but just in a, in a nutshell, that was what I had there. Luke. Thank you very much, John. Some, uh, some really good, interesting points in there. Um, I think that's a good one. The, the one that you, you finished on at the end there to, um, to make sure that you, you deal with the other side's opinions as well and the weak points that there might be. Because as I mentioned at the outset, getting an, an expert's opinion early on isn't necessarily just about bolstering your own position. Well, you know, yes, it's part of that. And, and understanding is there a technical opinion that supports the position you're taking? But also, what's the what's the counter? If you're if an independent expert is going to be asked what they think about this situation, and it's uh, not how um, the internal technical team was thinking about it, it's good to know that early for negotiations and to try and resolve disputes. Getting the right expert super important. I, I can certainly second that from my experience. Um, so yeah, th thank you, John. Uh, Ian, should we keep this moving along? Yes, can you hear me? We've got you, yep. Excellent, can you see my screen? Yes, there, yep, perfect. Excellent, excellent, okay. So, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name's Ian Hodges and I work at TMC Marine. We handle all types of incidents, accidents and disputes at sea from small cases like speed and performance claims to huge cases like the wreck removal of Seawall, Arena, Kia Trader, plus many more. Thank you, Luke, for the introduction. So what I'm about to tell you now is in my experience as an expert in London, working as a marine consultant. So the system in the UK typically works like this. <clears throat> Lawyers, owners, charters, p &I, all team up and appoint an expert and send them the necessary evidence. The expert examines the evidence and produces preliminary advice, and if requested to do so, they will produce a report. The report is exchanged with opposition lawyers, and then the expert is asked to review the opposition expert report. The two experts are then instructed to meet in order to produce a joint memorandum, which lists all the points on which they agree. That eliminates all the things which lawyers needn't argue over. A supplemental report is then produced by each expert and that's also exchanged. <clears throat> and at this point, if the lawyers can't settle the dispute, then there will be a hearing, which in London is typically arbitration, which consists of a panel of three people. 
These people can be marine engineers, master mariners, naval architects, or they may be solicitors or have legal expertise themselves. At any stage up to the point of arbitration with regard to reports and meetings and experts meetings, any case can settle at that stage. And I would estimate in all the ones I get involved with, 98%, 98% of all cases I see settle before the hearing. So to the expert, giving evidence to the tribunal. The tribunal is a very fair group of people who are there simply to find the truth and settle the case. They will help you all they can by interjecting when necessary. Arbitration is all very civilized and a calm matter. You will be questioned by the opposition counsel. These are very intelligent people who will know the case extremely well. And whilst they have perfect manners and will at times, at times try and charm you, they're ultimately there to undermine you and your evidence. The tribunal will keep counsel in check when needed. Stay focused on the tribunal and answer the questions as if you're talking to them. If you're nervous, look in their direction, but at the wall behind them, and in your mind, pretend you're talking to your partner or friend. If you say something you know to be confusing or incorrect, explain it right there and then. And when you're asked a question, do not try and fashion the answer to suit your case, as the tribunal will spot it immediately. You're supposed to be impartial. So don't try and defend the indefensible. You're not there to win the case, but simply there to assist the tribunal. You may have a very few strong points in your report, which you'd be itching to talk about. However, you will probably not be questioned about them. The last thing the opposition counsel wants is for you to cement your own case. That is why most of what they ask you about has nothing to do with your strong points. If your evidence is too strong and you're answering calmly and sensibly, you won't be questioned for long. Often you'll wonder why you're being asked a particular question as it may not seem relevant to the case. Don't query it, simply answer the question as best you can. If the tribunal consider it irrelevant, they will step in. And never allow yourself to become overconfident. If you think you're making good progress, beware, counsel may be about to trip you up. I have on occasion been presented with a document during the hearing which I've never seen before. You should immediately tell the tribunal that you've never seen it. And, that they will, and they will tell you how to deal with it. The point here is that it must be made known that at the time of writing your report, that said document had not been considered. Overall, London hearings are very professional, organising calm affairs to such an extent you don't actually know how well you're doing. So for the expert, it all starts with the creation of the report. This is really the fulcrum of the whole case in term, for, from, from the expert's perspective. perspective. So for live cases, get someone on board as soon as possible to gather the evidence. There's no excuse for owners not to do it. Do this. For charters, it's more difficult. Evidence vanishes very quickly. Even if you can't get onto the, out to the casualty, we can send a local surveyor and control him from London. We didn't used to do that often, but since COVID, we now do it regularly. Having said that, most of our work is historic, and so desk, a desktop exercise on documents alone. Don't swear outside your field of expertise. Typical case, shipping counters, heavy weather, which leads to engine, engine failure, then flooding. For that, you need a master mariner, marine engineer, and a naval architect. The case will probably start with the master as to, and why he entered the heavy weather, at which point the master mariner should not venture into engineering or stability, as that's not his expertise. If someone else has given input into your report, make sure it's stated within the report. For example, we often analyze, analyze voyage data recorders known as the black box. It, is often, it often takes a data analyst to decode the data and the report will stipulate that. If you're using any formula in a calculation, make sure you understand it. You may be asked to recalculate it using other variables. Council isn't interested in the alternative result. He's already worked it out. Council wants to see if you can make the calculation or not, which if you can't, is embarrassing for both the expert and their report. And I have seen this and it puts the expert into a spin. Know your report well. If you have said in your report the master was probably at fault, don't allow probably to be changed when questioned to possibly, as they are different in meaning. Know the points of agreement in the joint memorandum well. There are sometimes points in the memo which can answer a particular question from council. 
And during a break times and waiting times, beware what you talk about in public spaces. You wouldn't believe some of the conversations I've heard in the club room which directly relate to the case. I've also heard solicitors talk about other live cases, which I'm on the other side, as there are so few of us who get involved with these matters. The slide you're now seeing should be uh, the one I went, I'm sorry. The slide you're looking at now is the correct one. Opposition counsel, he, she is there to discredit you and undermine your report. They will normally be immaculately dressed with every hair in place. If counsel is unclear in the question or is causing you confusion, ask them to clarify. Don't let counsel make you opine on thing outside, things outside of your expertise. Probably or possibly, counsel will always try and subtly change your emphasis on something. Counsel may ask you something like, was the ship seaworthy in your opinion? That is a legal term and I deter any expert from using that, although they do. Seaworthiness has serious legal implications as does cargo worthiness. Don't let, car don't let counsel draw you into legal matters. Simply reply that you will leave that issue for the legal experts. Answer the question you are asked and don't elaborate. Counsel will let you sing like a bird, only stopping you if you're damaging his case. But he will allow you to continue if you're talking gibberish or helping his case. He'll make a note of anything you say not included in your report and may ask you about it there and then or maybe later on. The point here is not to give counsel any more ammunition. So dealing with our own lawyers. So these are the lawyers who have appointed you. Hopefully your lawyers will have appointed you early. The first thing you send your solicitor is the document request list for the particular incident. We've got dozens of them for most types of incident ready to go. At times, for whatever reason, they will try and ask you to comment on things outside your expertise. Do not wander outside your field, field of expertise. If lawyers make suggestions on what to say or how to say something in the extra report, be sure you agree with what they say, then put it in your own words. Don't allow lawyers to get you to use lawyerly phrases in your report. Don't use fancy words in the report, such as Latin, de minimis being a common one. Lawyers love Latin and it's fine for them to use it, but it's not for experts. I would encourage that facts stated in legal exchanges are not used to form your opinion. You must see the supporting evidence. And to, if you send an expert 5,000 pages, you should really read all of them. So if 4,000 are not relevant, don't send them. Lots of time can be wasted on reading things which are of no consequence to the expert. And don't make the budget too tight for the expert or we may miss something or not research a particular point which ought to be. And don't, please don't set unrealistic deadlines. Your expert probably has many other live cases. And finally, if you do reach arbitration stage and you have a decent expert who can write a decent report based on reliable evidence, then you're 50% of the way to successful outcome, even if your case is marginal. However, there is a final hurdle, which is that your expert needs to be calm, coherent, and above all, truthful. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. I, I really enjoyed that presentation. I, I thought it was spot on, if you don't mind me saying so. It's, it's actually probably 10 minutes that you could show to any new coming expert um, coming into your company or perhaps even some, uh, some that have been around for a while. Thank you. Yes. Some, great point, some great points in there. <laughs> Thank you. I think uh, uh, overriding is that, that notion of that an expert is there as an independent, neutral um, expert. They're there to give their independent um, view. And, and that's really, I think, central to this whole talk today. And a lot of the points that you made is uh, are when experts are straying from that, that cardinal uh, principle. So thanks again, Ian. Um, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, okay. Okay. So um, arbitrators, Anderson and Clanchy, uh, you're, you're the decision makers. You're being assisted by independent experts from both sides and being asked to take a view on which parts of the expert evidence you accept. Now, I'm not asking you to say who you prefer uh, today, uh, but um, your role is, is really to decide on the expert evidence before you, as you know. 
Sometimes there's consensus on aspects. Sometimes there are diametrically opposed views on, on other aspects. So in, in your experience as arbitrators, what, what works best in the presentation? Um, what is it in how expert evidence is presented that you find persuasive? Then on the flip side, uh, what doesn't work? What are, what are some of the, um, the classic or regular downfalls that you've seen um, experts or lawyers presenting expert evidence make? Any stories, no name stories that you uh, may be willing to share? Uh, and finally, uh, if you have time, if you could touch on any differences between the US and uh, the English arbitral bodies and, and the rules um, in the presentation of expert evidence. So starting with you, uh, Charles, um, if, if you could take it away, please. Thank you very much, uh, Luke. Uh, um... That's a very hard act to follow. Uh, I think uh, all of the speakers were pretty comprehensive in uh, describing the do's and don'ts of uh, expert uh, testimony and arbitration. I thought I might uh, just start by giving a little bit of background on whether or not uh, an expert's testimony is in fact admissible. Um, as we know, I think uh, arbitrators are not in the United States uh, generally bound by the federal rules of evidence. And uh, in our case, under the rules of the Society of Maritime Arbitrators, uh, the rule 23 and the, the society's rule provides that the parties may offer such evidence as they desire and shall produce such additional evidence as the panel may deem necessary to an understanding and determination of the dispute. And I think those are really key here because what I think arbitrators really will value uh, is when the expert specialized knowledge is going to help them uh, either understand the evidence or determine facts that may be an issue. And uh, rule 23 of the SMA rules also provides that the panel shall be the judge of the relevancy and materiality of the evidence uh, offered. Uh, some arbitration associations may incorporate uh, the federal rules of civil procedure, which provide uh, rules for the identification of experts, content of uh, reports and depositions, but where they might incorporate, for example, UNCITRAL, ICC, or IBA rules, but that's not the case with the SMA rules because uh, under those rules, the panel, the arbitrators, uh, have the discretion whether or not to admit uh, expert evidence. Now, in SMA arbitration, uh, Generally, the expert testimony and reports are going to be uh, admissible. And one reason for that uh, is because uh, there may be a problem enforcing an award uh, if the arbitrators uh, do not uh, permit uh, rele relevant or material evidence to, uh, to, be, uh, uh, to be put before them. Uh, so there is a generally a tendency to be very liberal about requests to introduce expert uh, evidence. And I think as the um, other panelists have said, in maritime arbitrations, there's a very, very wide range of accepted expert evidence. And those, some of those uh, areas have already been mentioned. Uh, some additional areas may be uh, foreign law, for example, uh, accounting uh, in uh, damages uh, issues, uh, valuations, uh, vetting, any matters involving technical issues, uh, recently, particularly issues such as bunker uh, quality or the operation of marine engines and equipment. So these are uh, areas where experts can be particularly useful to an arbitration panel. Uh, I should also maybe have a word about uh, expert reports, because this is one of the issues that comes up very frequently uh, in my experience in, in arbitration. Um, there's really no requirement uh, that specifies the content or the timing of the exchange of expert reports. So you very often may have issues about, well, what communications need to be disclosed? Uh, do uh, attorney uh, work product and uh, attorney client privileges apply? Uh, it's best, I think, for counsel to agree on the rules for disclosure in advance. And if they can't agree to contact the panel to avoid uh, surprise and uh, unfairness. Um, the good thing about SMA arbitration uh, is that the experts generally don't need to translate their opinions into layman's terms. 
uh, maritime arbitrators in New York, and I'm sure this is similar in London, are often chosen because of their expertise in areas which are the subject matter of the dispute, such as charter parties, collisions, cargo, naval architecture, engineering, and, and weather. Those are some of the areas where SMA arbitrators have uh, expertise. So the experts can actually um, speak the same language with the arbitrators. And uh, because the procedure is far less formal, uh, the arbitrators can communicate more freely with the experts. Uh, this also raises an issue uh, whether or not the expert is actually really needed in maritime arbitration. I think counsel need to ask themselves that question. And if they feel that an expert is needed, uh, they need to decide how the expert can be used most effectively. Because uh, unfortunately, the use of experts drives up the cost of arbitration, which is supposed to be cost effective and an expeditious uh, alternative to litigation. So I would agree with the previous um, panelists that it's a good idea to make use of consulting experts uh, to identify the strengths and weaknesses of the case before you make that demand for arbitration. Uh, also, if counsel can't cooperate and limit the number and scope of expert issues, the panel should establish uh, procedures that will narrow the use of expert evidence to those topics that will uh, assist in the resolution of the dispute. Um, some possible innovations which aren't frequently used in my experience in New York would be uh, to agree on the appointment of a single expert. Um, in the maritime industry, the experts are generally few in number, and they're often known to the parties and possibly have been consulted by them in other cases. Uh, so it may be possible to agree on a single uh, expert uh, to um, uh, testify as to discrete issues that maybe uh, will come up in the arbitration. Uh, I think probably James will mention this, but I understand in the UK, it's common to also uh, do joint conferencing of experts so that uh, they can prepare a report identifying areas of agreement and disagreement in advance. A problem I think in that respect is whether or not counsel should be permitted to attend uh, because that can raise uh, a lot of issues in terms of the ultimate reliability of the, uh, of the experts uh, reports. And then Luke, I've also heard of uh, something which I understand is an Australian invention called hot tubbing. Uh, where, um, and it, it is apparently becoming more popular in international arbitrations where the experts are examined together and they can comment on each other's testimony and respond to questions by counsel and the panel. And this can often help to uh, restrain some of the excesses that uh, experts may tend to, uh, to, uh, to, to exercise and make them more comfortable uh, when they're examined in a uh, conference setting. So uh, going to what works and what doesn't work, um, it's probably ax uh, axiomatic that the par parties do not appoint experts who do not support their case. And experts very often are paid significant amounts of money to prepare uh, reports. Uh, I can only reemphasize what's already been said. What definitely does not work is where the expert becomes an advocate for the uh, party who appointed him or her. Um, also, it's very important that the experts stick to his or her particular discipline. I've had situations, for example, where a uh, navigation expert may venture into areas which are really not the subject of his expertise, such as, for example, the uh, uh, tensile strength of a mooring line. Uh, by the same token, uh, it's important not to relegate the expert's role to the panel. Uh, if you ask arbitrators to uh, serve as, as accountants, for example, in a uh, question where damages are at issue and they have to sort out voluminous damage documentation, it's not going to be cost effective. And it's one of the areas where expert testimony can, I think, in my experience, be most helpful. Um, again, don't cling to a point in cross-examination um, if it appears to be wrong. Um, this leads to a loss of credibility and the appearance of bias. Uh, don't give lectures, just answer the question and leave the follow-up uh, to uh, direct or redirect. Uh, don't debate with counsel and wait until the question has been fully stated and don't talk over counsel. Uh, very importantly, don't give opinions as to the credibility of a fact witness's testimony or testify that a disputed fact actually occurred 
or attempt to sort out conflicting testimony, because that's the job of the arbitrator. And remember that arbitrators will definitely take apparent bias into account when weighing the expert's evidence. So the, the last point I would make is just to summarize that uh, impartiality, uh, independence, and transparency are really key in determining the extent to which the panel will be persuaded by the expert. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, uh, some, some fascinating points there and um, uh, excellent guidance, if I may say. I, I, I think you're right to uh, identify the damages question. So many legal cases turn on the question of damages. The measure, the legal measure um, on many cases is what is the market? Uh, so getting an expert on the market is, is very important. It's an interesting point you make about whether experts are needed. Um, and by that, I understand you to mean the independent expert that's actually put before the, um, the panel uh, where you might have a consulting expert in the background. Um, I, th I agree. I think it's, it's a good point. Um, save that in, in many instances, you may not be, as, as counsel, you may not be fully aware of um, the background or the experience of a particular arbitrator that you have not appointed. Um, and depending on what the issues are that unfold in that particular arbitration, perhaps there, there sometimes is a case to say, well, um, uh, the, an expert is needed to ensure that all, all members of, of a panel, if it's a three-person panel, um, uh, have this issue uh, fully explained. But I, I definitely take your point about um, the exp expertise of the SMA arbitrator roster. Um, and hot, hot tubbing got a reference in there. Um, <laughs> I, I haven't personally had it on one of my uh, arbitrations. I have not too long ago had a Californian attorney call me um, on a maritime arbitration to see, you know, would it work uh, from, from our experience in international arbitration? Um, and it reminds me, I've got to follow up and find out whether that actually happened or not. So um, thank you, Charles. Uh, James, uh, may I hand over to you, please? Yes, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for your introduction at the beginning. If I may, I need to make a small correction, which is that I'm not yet a, a full-time arbitrator. I'm, I'm getting there, um, but my caseload wouldn't justify that yet. I work part-time for LexisNexis UK on its arbitration PSL practical guidance module, which apart from anything else gives me quite a good perspective on international commercial arbitration in its, in its wider sense. And I'm an associate member of Six Pump Court Chambers, a barrister's chambers in, in London. I'm a non-practicing solicitor now. Um, I had also in a previous life been an avocat at the Paris Bar. I worked in Paris for four years. Uh, I was mainly dealing with uh, shipping cases and, and arbitration. And of course, practicing in France, I became used to court appointed experts. Um, when a casualty occurs or there's an incident um, on board a vessel and it's put in at a French port, the, the first thing that happens is that an application is made to the court to appoint an expert um, to go and gather the factual evidence for the, for the commercial port in, in France. So that's given me as well a bit of a perspective on the use of experts in civil law jurisdictions. Um, but I, I just wanted to to make my usual uh, disclaimer now, which is that um, the, the views that I express are entirely my own and don't represent those of my employer or of any organization I'm associated with, which would include the, the LMAA. I'm not sure I've got that much more to say now because I agree with everything that's been said so far. And I'm very grateful to, to Charles for covering the ground extremely well. Um, I will have something to say about hot tubbing, so please remind me if, um, if I don't manage to, to squeeze that in. Um, but in answer to the general question about how uh, arbitrators like to see um, expert evidence presented, I'm afraid it's the old lawyer's answer of it depends. Um, it, it depends, obviously, on, on the case and on the issues. But what I was going to focus on um, now, if I may, is actually on the tribunal and the relevant rules. Um, 
Luke had asked me to talk about any relevant differences between LMAA procedure and the LCIA. And that is something that I would like to, to talk about. Um, perhaps the distinction though is a rather wider one and it's one between what you might call traditional maritime arbitration and um, institutional arbitration um, more, more generally. The, the point's already um, been well made um, by Ian and by Charles indeed, that of course in a maritime arbitration, the tribunal itself will have experts on it. And just to um, confirm that, in the LMAA's Code of Ethics, which is its Code of Ethics for Arbitrators, which is available on its website, um, there is a paragraph on competence which says that to be competent, an arbitrator should have sufficient knowledge and experience of the matters in dispute to enable him or her to understand them without requiring unduly long explanations. I think that's quite a useful summary of what's expected of a, of a maritime arbitrator. If you're going to an institutional arbitration, so if you're going to the LCA, for example, um, you would hope uh, that at least one member of the tribunal would have such sufficient knowledge and experience. And it has to be said that in the LCA, that would be um, a realistic hope in general, but um, there, there will be cases where, where that um, doesn't happen. And indeed, in the present climate in international arbitration, there are more and more calls for arbitrators not to be experts on the grounds that if they do have expertise, it um, might undermine their independence. And I've even heard um, a lawyer speaking at an LCA event saying that um, he couldn't understand why there was all this fuss about um, the need for maritime arbitrators to be allowed to have uh, repeat appointments, because surely it's in the interests of members of the maritime industries to appoint generalist lawyers like himself. Um, he said, as a lawyer, I can understand any contract. I've never dealt with a charter party, but I'm sure I could decide a dispute under a charter party. That's the um, kind of attitude which you do get at, centering around some of the institutions, and one needs to be wary of that. And partly because non-specialists can be appointed as, as arbitrators, Lawyers, um, as has been mentioned, will have different approaches to uh, how to deal with the tribunal. And so it so happens in an institutional arbitration in which I'm sitting at the moment. I received an email just an hour ago from um, uh, lawyers outside England who um, uh, sent me a, an Ullage report. And in their covering email, they explained to me what an Ullage report is. Well, they do it very concisely and it's, um, it's, it's quite helpful but that wouldn't happen in an LMA arbitration where it would just be assumed that some of the terminology and some of the um, ordinary uh, processes would be would be well known um, so it, it's important to know who your tribunal is and it's also important to know what the attitude of that tribunal under the particular rules is likely to be um, and here there is, I think, quite a difference between institutional arbitration and um, LMA um, arbitration, certainly, and quite possibly SMA too. And that is that um, LMA arbitrators are extremely um, cost conscious. Um, and the LMA terms themselves um, reflect that. They have a sort of a soft form of costs budgeting in the um, second schedule, for example. That is to say, um, costs estimates have to be presented in advance of, of a hearing. And that obviously includes, very importantly, um, budgets for the, the experts' reports and expert uh, uh, testimony. Now, you don't get that kind of cost control in an institutional arbitration. And that's actually one of the reasons why in an institutional arbitration, expert evidence can be presented at just about any time from just about anybody. 
experts' reports can be annexed to memorials filed at the very beginning of a case, for example. There's much less of a, a, of a tradition of keeping an eye on the costs, and therefore there is less, if you like, interference quite often by the tribunal in an institutional arbitration in dictating or deciding um, which experts are needed on, on which issues. I'm running quite um, short of time, but I, I thought I would just confirm um, that the LMAA um, does make specific provision in its rules, and this isn't uh, so new, it dates back to the 2017 terms, for, for hot tubbing. Um, it's, it's, it's quite nice. You, you think of the LMAA as being uh, terribly traditional and, and British, more cold bath than hot tub, really. Um, but in the fourth schedule, um, in paragraph three, we have um, E, without prejudice to the tribunal's power to require experts to give evidence simultaneously, hot tubbing, the parties should seek to agree whether this would be appropriate. But <laughs> uh, I've certainly never seen it in practice myself. Having said that, it was something that was talked about at the LMAA Spring Seminar uh, last month um, by, by Lewis Moore, who also confessed that um, he'd not been involved in any hot tubbing, but the fact that it was talked about suggests that there is interest in it. Thank you. Thank you, James. Um... If I may just touch on that last point first, I, I won't ask John and Ian uh, what their views are on hot tubbing and, and whether they're interested in it anytime soon. Um, I'll just park that one right there. But it, 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 joking aside, it, it is a, an interesting concept and, and I think um, there might be something to it on the, on the right type of case. Um, and, and I think the other point that I wanted to just make is we've, we've stumbled upon or we've, we've um, identified some differences here between, and thank you for this, James, between institutional approaches and um, the, uh, the more industry maritime approaches of the LMAA and the SMA when it comes to whether an arbitrator should have technical um, experience or not, and, and the pros or perhaps cons of that. Um, that type of approach. I can see in the institutional approach, it's more repli more emulates or replicates a court environment where judges often don't have that kind of technical um, expertise. Whereas if you're trying for a perhaps a, a lower cost resolution, then um, having arbitrators who can get right into the, the technical issues uh, quickly is, is a positive thing. Um, so thank you for those points. Uh, thank you, everyone. I would like to get into questions and talk about this for another um, hour, but unfortunately our time is up. Um, thank you for everyone who's listened in today. We're delighted that you've, um, you, you've come through this seminar and we hope very much that you've uh, found it interesting. You've got some good tips to take away uh, from today. Um, and uh, on behalf of uh, all, all the panelists, we'd like to thank you. I'd also like to thank each of the panelists for their time in preparing and attending today. Uh, thank you, Eva, John, Ian, Charles, and James. Much appreciated. Until next time, take care, everyone.